Hey guys, Spencer Sack right here. Today we are going to be looking at the image quality of the Panasonic S1H. Now this isn't going to be a full review, I'm not going to dive into all the features and specs of this camera. I'm here to talk about the image quality that I'm getting out of the camera in a real world scenario. As I normally do on this channel, I don't like to just take a camera out and just shoot around outside and see what it can do. I actually want to put it in a scenario that I might use it on a real production. So this weekend, my wife and I went out of town for a little bit and I booked us an Airbnb that might look pretty good on camera. So I thought it would be a good chance to take the S1H out and see what it could do. So I'm not gonna sit here and just talk about what the camera can do all together. Why don't we just jump right into some footage and let's talk about the camera and what I liked about it. The first thing that intrigued me about this camera was definitely that it was a full frame camera. As you know, I've been talking about this a lot on my channel. I'm always looking for the new full frame cameras out on the market. Full frame is something that I've wanted ever since I started filmmaking. Now it's not really been something that's been obtainable. Um, of course, when the 5D Mark II came out, that was like the first full frame camera that you could shoot on and everyone was really excited about that. Uh, but of course it only shot 8-bit H.264 and uh, unfortunately everyone was shooting wide open and everything kind of looked like a blurry mess. I'm not going to lie, I tend to do that too and I definitely did that a little bit in this video, but you will see that the image quality out of this camera is much better than that 5D Mark II. Now I've tested quite a few full frame cameras on this channel before. I've done the Canon EOS R, I've done the Nikon Z6 with the Atmos recorder, and then in my last uh, full frame video I did the Sigma FP. Now they all have their pros and weaknesses, and this one I thought would really just live in the same world as the other cameras, but the price tag was really high. I thought $4,000 might be a little high for any common mirrorless camera, but then Netflix came out saying that this was the first mirrorless camera that they were going to approve for any Netflix production. Now that intrigued me a little bit. You know, I, I don't really know what Netflix's full like spec sheet really means or anything like that, but it'd get me thinking that this camera might be different than the rest. Now my guess is that Netflix is always looking for a high quality codec and a decent dynamic range out of the camera before they'll approve it for their productions. So I knew that automatically this one had a 10-bit codec. A lot of cameras are coming out finally now with 10-bit codecs and I'm always looking for that. You know, 8-bit codecs really don't do it for me and I really want 10-bit and above before I'll consider the camera for production. But after those Netflix articles, it really got me intrigued about the camera and I thought I would try it out and see if it was really worth the cost, especially against something like the Sigma FP that just recently came out and I recently reviewed, because it'll do 12-bit RAW and it only costs $1,800. So the first thing that I'll say about the camera is that it's massive. Now, yeah, it looks like a regular SLR, regular mirrorless camera from any of the photos that you might see online, but if you compared it to something else, like, okay, here's my iPhone 10, for example, it is very, very large and it's very heavy and it's definitely the biggest camera that I've ever used um, in the mirrorless style format. I would say something like a Canon 1DX is really big too and it's more big like vertical than it is wide like this and it has this huge, this just thing has a huge grip on it and it's really heavy. I mean it of course has giant vents on the side of it to cool down that full frame sensor when shooting video. I mean you're able to get 6K 10 bit out of this camera. Now you're only going to get the 420 version of a 10-bit image out of this camera. So Panasonic claims that this camera has a 14-stop latitude. Now I used to own the Panasonic GH5S um, back when it first came out, and I think they rated that at 13 stops of latitude, but the only flat profile that you could get for it was the V-Log L, which wasn't the full V-Log spectrum that you'd get out of the um, Panasonic cinema cameras. Now this camera actually comes equipped with the regular Panasonic V-Log, which means I bet you're gonna get most of that 14 stops so you're not gonna be crippled by the V-Log L profile. Now normally when a company like Panasonic, Sony, or Canon talk about their dynamic range, they're not usually using the same like graph that RED might be using when talking about um, dynamic range. I feel like they're always fibbing just a little bit because your, their codecs normally limit how much dynamic range you can actually get out of the camera. But in the situation, we're talking about a full frame sensor, you get the full V-Log and you're gonna get a really nice 10-bit codec. So I got a little bit optimistic about this because what happens is when you're shooting a 10-bit codec, you're actually gonna get more luminance range in your color space to actually work with the dynamic range. Now I did not find this to really be true with the, the Nikon Z6. Um, I feel like its dynamic range wasn't very good to begin with, but it's really only rated at 12 and a half stops and I don't think you're really gonna get that full 12 and a half stops and it kind of shows on the Nikon. But I will tell you, the first thing that I noticed about this camera is that it actually has a really nice high dynamic range. Very comparable to any other real cinema camera that I've used recently. I would say the dynamic range is just as good as the Blackmagic Pocket, or maybe even better. That full frame really lets in a lot of light, and it really has a nice spectrum when you're shooting indoors. But rather than just talking about the specs, let's just jump into the sequence that I created in our little boutique hotel so you can see what the camera could do. 
Now this is just my wife. She's just walking into the room, putting on her Apple Watch and getting ready for the day. So I thought I would shoot that in a way that felt like a real sequence that you might see in a commercial. And of course I controlled the light myself. So the light is coming in through the window behind her and then I have it bouncing off of a five in one reflector coming from the same side that the light is coming from. So it doesn't feel um, like a fake light is put on the other side of her face. I just pushed that 501 reflector as close as I could to her face to um, really help that light be as soft as possible and look as natural as possible. So for the opening wide shot here, I'm using the S1H and my vintage Canon 55 millimeter F1.2. And I think I'm shooting at somewhere between a two and a four on this shot. And I'm shooting on the base size, so of 640. I'm of course using an ND filter. I'm just using a cheap Zomi $20 ND filter off of Amazon. The link to that is in the description below. It's a really affordable ND filter, but it seems to work really well on all the cameras that I use it on. So in the first shot, I um, shot in 6K just to see what the 6K could do, even though it's a 10-bit codec with only a 420 color space. And I didn't really want to shoot in it that much. I know a lot of people are going to get this camera because they think 6K resolution is what's needed. But as, if you've watched the channel before, you know that 6K isn't the main component of a camera that I'm looking for. Um, I'm usually looking for dynamic range and bit depth over the resolution. I did think it made sense to shoot a little bit with the 6K just to see how the codec holds up. Now once we pop into the close-ups here, I am shooting in the 422 10-bit Cinema 4 4K resolution on the camera and I'm still obviously staying on the Canon 55mm f1.2 and as you can see the image is really really nice. Now something I can say here really quickly is that this is the best internal codec I've ever worked with on a camera that is not shooting raw or some sort of uh, raw compressed um, codec. I believe this is 422 10-bit uh, H265 and the colors just move around super super easily in post and I had zero problems with um, coloring this image once I got it into DaVinci Resolve. Something I'll even say is that when you're in DaVinci or any other kind of coloring program and you push the uh, temperature slider on your camera and it's not shooting raw, the image starts to, starts to get a little weird and the colors start to change a little bit in a way that you may not want. Sometimes it's nice to have just to like push it a little bit cooler, a little bit warmer, and it usually works okay. But normally when you're shooting on a compressed coat like this, when you push it too far and actually try to change white balance altogether, maybe all the way from 5600 to 3200, the image usually starts to break, um, usually when you're working, even with some 10-bit codecs, but definitely with the 8-bit codecs. But on this camera, when I pushed that slider around, it was just like I was using a raw image. Now, I don't want to talk up the codec too much, but it's like I said, it's definitely the best codec I've ever used in a camera that was not a raw codec. All right, so let's look at the sequence again, but shot a little bit differently in a more low lit situation, something that looks more like a nighttime situation versus the daytime scenario that we shot in originally. So once again, I'm still at ISO 640, but I set up a little LED panel in the room and bounced it off the curtains to camera right um, to give her a little key light that's being motivated by the lamp on the table. And I actually set the color temperature on that light to 3200 Kelvin, but I left the camera at 5600 Kelvin to really help give a nice warm glow and kind of sell that that was a regular practical light sitting on the side table. And I tweaked the color temperature just a little bit in post just to kind of make the light seem a little bit more pleasant on her face. And like I said before, I had zero problems with tweaking the color temperature, as well as adding any LUTs or color to this um, codec. It just handled everything flawlessly. And I'm serious about that. It handled everything flawlessly. I actually really couldn't break the image. I can even push the saturation all the way to 100, add another node to that color space and push the saturation even more. And the image really wasn't breaking. It, it just kind of blew my mind a little bit. And something I'll say, comparing the 4K versus the 6K, the 6K held up really well as well. Um, I actually didn't see, seem to have that many color issues with the 420 color space. The color actually was really nice. So if you feel like you really want to shoot 6K on this camera, I really wouldn't hesitate to do that. I would just keep in mind you're going to get a little bit less color depth from that codec, but it's something that I didn't really have any problems with when shooting. Let's talk about a couple things that kind of bothered me about the camera. Definitely um, something that bothered me was, you know, after having all these codec options, I mean, it has like 25 or 30 codec options on it, which is really amazing for a camera like this. But when you, if you want to go into a higher frame rate above 30 frames per second, maybe 48 or 60 or 120, you are going to crop into the sensor. And that was just a big bummer. If this camera could do everything that it does, but it could do full frame 4K 60, I would buy this camera immediately. But unfortunately, this camera has to crop into a super 35 millimeter mode when it wants to use 48 or 60 frames per second. 
Now, it's not the end of the world. I mean, I've been shooting Super 35 for most of my uh, career, and it looks great. Um, so I don't know why I want to complain about it too much, but the only, you know, but the reason you would be getting a camera like this is maybe to get the full frame and not um, get a Super 35 millimeter sensor. Definitely when it comes to price, because you can get a Blackmagic Pocket 6K for $2,500. It'll do 6K raw at 60 frames per second in the Super 35 millimeter uh, crop. Um, and that's a lot less money than it would cost to have this camera. But that to be said, this camera has a lot of features that the Blackmagic Pocket 6K definitely does not have. First off, it has a flip out screen, so you can actually get low angle shots or high angle shots and be able to see what you're doing on the screen that comes with your camera. That's something that none of the full frame cameras besides the Canon EOS R could do up until this point. It also has an amazing electronic viewfinder, so you can take the camera and actually put it up against your face and have a nice point of contact to get a more stable image when shooting. So you can kind of pick this camera up and just start shooting with it and not have to worry about kitting this camera out at all. Actually, it also comes with a ginormous battery that lasts many, many hours, which the other cameras definitely cannot compete with. Um, it has two uh, SD card slots on the side of it, so you can be shooting to one and back up to another. Um, it has customizable buttons on it. This has a lot of features that a lot of these cameras don't really come with these days. And so that's kind of where the $4,000 might make more sense for this camera, but that still seems a little bit steep. It kind of feels like it's in between something like um, your common mirrorless camera and between a cinema camera. It's kind of like the hybrid of the two. Like, in the real sense of the word and not just like people call like a Canon EOS R a hybrid. No, it's not really that much of a hybrid because it's still shooting with an 8-bit codex. So at the end of the day, it's really not a full-blown cinema camera. Definitely not by Netflix standards. So if you're looking for something to kind of fill that void, this camera is perfect for you. If you want something that's kind of like a C100, C200 that you can just pick up, start shooting with, feel really comfortable with and get an amazing image out of it, this camera can definitely fit into that spot for you. Now, of course, it doesn't have built-in NDs like a, a real cinema camera might have, but we all know you can put ND filters on the front of your lens that um, for very inexpensive and it'll get the job done. Now, the camera also has dual native ISO, um, which, which means it should handle low light very well, but that's not something I tested out because um, I've only had the camera for a few days, so I didn't really get that far into my testing so far. But I do think I'm going to do so another follow-up video with this camera because it, it I like it so much that I think I need to test it out even more. So I think I'm going to start comparing it to a few more cameras so we can really see what it can do. Definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't already or hit the bell notification so you can see when my next video comes out. It most likely will be a comparison video with the Panasonic S1H and something like a full-blown cinema camera. Now I'm sure there's more I could have talked about in this video, but I will leave that for my next video when I do a more proper comparison with more cinema cameras to see what this camera is really capable of. And really decide if it's something that I might get for myself or something that you guys might want for yourself. Um, so let me know if you like this video. Tell me what you think about the Panasonic S1H. Do you feel like the video quality holds up to the other full frame cameras I've tested on, this, on the channel? Let me know in the comments below. And until next time, guys, I'm Spencer Sakurai. See ya.